The Agricultural Health and Safety Network, known as the Network, was founded with a mission to improve health and safety on the farm through education, service, and evaluation research. Within the Canadian Centre for Health and Safety in Agriculture, CCHSA, at the University of Saskatchewan, the network recognizes the importance of providing health and safety information and programming to agricultural producers. The network's goal is to reduce injury and illness related to the farm environment through cooperative efforts with our partners. The network is a partnership between CCHSA, Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, or SARM, the Ministry of Agriculture, and Saskatchewan's RMs. In response to the need of the Saskatchewan rural population, the network partnered with the Farm Stress Line of the Ministry of Agriculture to produce Sleepless in Saskatchewan. The Farm Stress Line provides confidential peer telephone counseling support, information and referral services responding to the needs of rural people, families and communities. The FSL believes that people are empowered through information and are able to make appropriate changes and choices where there is quality, accurate information to base decisions upon. The partnership was ideal for both organizations. Sleepless in Saskatchewan began in 2005 as a workshop that provided a new understanding of the importance of sleep to our health and well-being. Once having experienced the workshop, the Agricultural Health and Safety Network and the Farm Stress Line recognized that it was important to provide farm and rural people with an opportunity to experience the workshop. We therefore approached John Shearer with the proposal to hold evening workshops throughout the province. Over the past two years, 21 community workshops have occurred throughout the province, attracting thousands of participants. The workshops address the impact of sleep deprivation and stress in relation to farm families. There's been considerable positive feedback on the workshop, and participants comment that the information presented by John is practical, relevant, and motivating. We quickly recognized that the workshops that were being hosted around the province could serve as a platform for the development of a DVD that had the potential to reach many more farm families, both provincially and nationally. Recognizing the relationship between stress and sleep promoted continuation of the partnership between the farm stress line and the network in the production of the DVD. The Sleepless in Saskatchewan DVD project brings quality information about sleep to Saskatchewan farm and ranch families. With farmers working long hours and coping with farm stress, adequate sleep and rest are necessary to decrease their risks of illness, injury and death. Sleepless in Saskatchewan was made possible through the cooperation and financial support of many. The Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture provided the initial funding that got the project off the ground and subsequently allowed the Canadian Centre to successfully gain funding from the Canadian Agricultural Safety Association through its CASHP program of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. The project would not have been possible without the support of the Saskatchewan Association for Rural Municipalities and individual rural municipalities that hosted Sleepless in Saskatchewan presentations and workshops throughout the province. There were many individuals who gave of their time for interviews on this subject of sleep, a subject that has captured the interest of so many individuals. Sleepless in Saskatchewan is truly a collaborative effort between the Canadian Centre for Health and Safety in Agriculture and the Saskatchewan Farm Stress Line, Rural Municipalities and the Canadian Agriculture Safety Association. And of course, a very special thanks to John Shearer for this DVD. Without his enthusiastic support and commitment, this project would not have been possible. Harvey Milanowicz, director of the Northwest Region, Saskatchewan SARM Board of Directors said in an interview, quote, Sleepless in Saskatchewan will help any farm family or farm operation within the province to reduce farm injuries and fatalities. You'll be more alert in your farming operations to reduce farm incidents, and your quality of life will improve. I'm more than happy that this resource is there to help.
the Canadian Centre for Health and Safety in Agriculture, through its extension division of the Agricultural Health and Safety Network, in partnership with the Farm Stress Line of the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture and support of the Canadian Agricultural Safety Association, presents Sleepless in Saskatchewan. Good afternoon. This is your Captain James Smith speaking. On behalf of myself and the crew, I'd like to welcome you to Saskatoon. The current time is 10.35 a.m. and the temperature is 21 degrees. This flight terminates here, so on behalf of the crew, I'd like to thank you. The Sleepless in Saskatchewan uh, workshop started in 2005 and it was one of the resources that we developed to help meet the need that we felt that farm families were expressing at that time. There was a high level of uh, farm stress and we wanted to develop a resource that would help enable farm families um, to work through this stress and consequently deal with some of the sleep problems that they were having. Nova Scotia. Okay. So, and then wonders of all wonders in Ottawa. Because oh. you're never an expert in your own town. You know? No. You've got to come from someplace. Well, rest the sleigh. More uh, dramatically than cold air. Let me pick it up. No. no. Good evening. Thank goodness you're awake. I'm a sleep researcher by trade. In other words, I watch people sleep for a living. From the looks of a couple of you, I've come to the right spot. <laughs> so, you have to put up with those long hours and maybe a little bit less sleep once in a while, but you have problems that you leave money. You know, we can work out our differences or issues, but when it comes to the money, that's the stress part, and that affects the sleep, a big time. Hey, I remember lots of rounds in combines and stuff, you know, three, four in the morning, but you didn't remember those rounds either. Oh, where am I? Like, you know, you're, kind of going with one eye open. <laughs> when you don't have enough sleep and, and you're ready to nod off, that that would be when a serious accident could occur. We're a kinky lot, us sleep researchers. We put electrodes on people's bodies and we put them in tiny little rooms and we watch them all night. And there's a lot of things that turn us on. Would you like to see something that really turns a sleep researcher on? Would you? Yeah. Would you? Yeah. yeah, you sure? Yeah. Okay, you're going to have to follow me, all right? So if it means you have to turn around to look, you have to follow me. This is something that turns a sleep researcher on more than anything else in the world. All right, this is the one thing that if the whole world looked this way, sleep researchers would absolutely love it. And that's a head like this one. <laughs> You wouldn't believe how the electrodes stick to this stuff. <laughs> this one's coming along just fine. Oh, look at this one. I mean, that's a classic piece of work. I'm a, a, a little bit more work on there and that'd be okay, right? My goodness. Sleep, it's one of the most beautiful parts of life. A time to relax, a time to release the hardships of the day, to rejuvenate ourselves. But what happens if we can't get a good night's sleep? What if no matter how hard we try, we just can't fall asleep? Sleep deprivation is a universal problem affecting millions of people around the world, and Saskatchewan is not immune to its ill effects. Young and old, urban and rural dwellers, we're all at risk. 
In the agriculture industry, varied hours, tight schedules, financial obligations, and stress may affect a person's regular sleep habits. A neighbor, a friend, or a spouse could be suffering from some form of sleep-related disorder. Impaired mental and physical abilities, increased health risks, higher levels of stress and irritability, and worst of all, accidents and loss of life can all be traced to a lack of sleep. If you or someone you know suffers from sleep deprivation, what can you do? Where do you start? In this culture, sleep is considered on the same level as death. What are you when you're really tired? Dead tired. <laughs> John was recommended as being um, a speaker that was very dynamic and entertaining, but had really good substance. So he talked about the dynamics of sleep, how to, how to get a good sleep, practical tips people could implement, and easy, inexpensive ways um, to get a good sleep. We, hadn't, we, we didn't have any tools how to sleep. And that's, that was the long and short of it. And John helped us out with those. But what a silly thing to not learn. Like, everybody needs to well, sleep. How many hours do you actually sleep in your lifetime? I think, you know, for me, there's a whole bunch of factors that come into sleep. And um, stress is certainly a big one for me. I find I don't sleep as well as I should when I'm uh, stressed. And those stresses come from both my job and from the farm and from raising children, all of those things. When I was working shift work, I could sleep probably three, three and a half hours in a nice solid deep sleep. Then I would wake up and I would toss and turn and toss and turn until finally I'd give up and, uh, and just get up. So I was tired all the time. Yeah, then when you're working shift and, and getting tired, you can get high stress. <laughs> sleep was always, you know, on the back burner. That was always the last thing you considered, you know. Getting, you know, doing your job and doing the farm thing was priority one. Like that's, you know, if there was time left over, you'd sleep. <laughs> Agriculture is a huge part of life on the prairies. It's always been a physically demanding occupation with a high potential for accidents. This is partly due to complex machinery and unpredictable livestock. Another reason is the fatigue caused by long hours, demanding work and time pressures. Over the last number of years, income levels in agriculture have decreased, making secondary jobs necessary. The demands of running an agricultural operation supplemented with a full or part-time job has changed the face of the industry. Sleep deprivation is a constant threat as people try to maintain their livelihoods. Doing shift work, uh, I found that it was very hard to sleep through the day on the farm. There was uh, a lot of uh, noise, uh, tractors running, uh, my kids were smaller, they were playing, making noise. Trying to sleep through the day, you know, when, it, when it's naturally daylight out and sleep was difficult. During planting and harvesting, Agricultural workers try to cheat sleep, thus increasing their risk for poor judgment, mistakes, and injury. The machines they use may have many moving parts that cause severe injury or death. Work is often done on wet, slippery, and uneven surfaces, and timelines are often hectic as they compete with weather, insects, and weeds. Agricultural workers are often on the road either moving machinery, driving to town for parts, or hauling livestock or grain. An 80-hour work week is sort of average from uh, you know April the 1st to November the 1st and uh, that's just exactly what what happens. It's like the Indianapolis 500 around here in the spring and you just go hard you know and um, yeah it's hard to deal with it really is. As you get older you find yourself you know if I'm waiting for customers at night you're sitting in the truck waiting for them or in the scale shack and you're, and you're uh, uh, you know, you just fall asleep. You just not often fall asleep because you haven't, you're sleep deprived, you know. Most farmers push it to the limit. I have, I'm, I've got neighbors too that go round the clock, three, on two, two, three hours of sleep, and then, and, and then things are happening and they wonder why. You, you've got to change lifestyle, take your breaks, 
get your proper rest, and that will help your situation greatly in anyone's situation. People calling the farm stress line speak of being burnt out. You know, they talk about uh, mental and physical toll. These double shifts and, and the lack of sleep associated with them can translate into a variety of, of negative effects. I think the most important thing is to get people to recognize that they're a 24 hour day animal. Most of the time we just think about our waking period. We don't think about our sleeping period. We do things to help ourselves through the waking period. Uh, we eat appropriately, um, we relax appropriately, but we don't do anything to ensure good quality sleep because none of us really, as a society, were ever really taught to do that. We weren't taught that certain foods promote certain kinds of sleep. We weren't taught that certain exercise promotes certain kinds of sleep. If we're gonna cheat on anything, we cheat on our sleep. Most people have experienced times when we are sleep deprived for a day or two. But people with sleep disorders are chronically sleep deprived, and that can last years. The Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan houses a sleep disorders center the center has a sleep research laboratory that studies the clinical aspects of sleep. Dr. Robert Scomro, an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan, is a sleep specialist and director of the sleep research laboratory. We realize that sleep is very, very important. We realize that most of us, in, at least in North America and Europe, are getting less sleep than we, than we actually need. Um, and we realize that as we sleep, we go through different stages of sleep or cycles of sleep, if you will. Uh, it used to be thought that sleep is a fairly inactive state. Uh, in other words, everything shuts down or goes to rest. That's not necessarily true. And in fact, brain and other organs are quite active in some stages of sleep and, and quite inactive in others. In our fast-paced society, sleep can seem like a luxury, but this is simply not true. We need quality sleep for good health. Sleep deprivation affects our entire body and mind. Our nighttime journey starts in what is known as a hypnogogic state. This is the transition period of being awake and falling asleep. A pre-sleep stage called a hypnogogic. This is typically where we get comfortable in bed. And we have a ritual, and most people I, that I've seen in the lab always go through the same little ritual. They lay on their back for a while, they turn on their side, they turn the pillow covers over, they kick their foot out of bed. They've got these kind of little rituals about getting comfortable. As we leave the hypnagogic state, we enter into sleep cycles with specific sleep stages. Understanding these cycles and stages can help us get a better sleep. A sleep cycle is 90 to 110 minutes in duration. In a normal night, an individual may have four to five cycles. The sleep cycles move back and forth between more alert sleep to deep restorative sleep throughout the night. There are two categories of sleep. REM, or rapid eye movement, and non-REM. Non-REM sleep consists of four stages that range from light dozing to deep sleep. Each sleep stage is important for overall quality sleep. You've seen people in stage one sleep. They're at meetings typically. <laughs> oh yeah. You ever watch them? They're like this. Yes? You ever seen that? Stage one sleep. I've driven with people in stage one sleep. I mean, they're at the in the wheel. Stage one is a very light sleep, and as we drift in and out, we are still easily awakened. This first stage lasts only five to 10 minutes. This is the only stage that does not repeat throughout the night in its entirety. As we leave stage one sleep, we enter into what is often considered the official onset of consolidated sleep, or stage two. Stage two sleep, um, most people don't even know that they're asleep when they're in stage two sleep. You wake somebody up out of stage two sleep and you say to them, were you awake or were you asleep? Nine times out of ten they'll say, I was awake. In stage two sleep, a lot of strange things happen. This is where men will snort themselves into existence. You ever watched a man snort themselves into consciousness? I mean, it's hilarious. There they are, very, very painful, and all of a sudden, painful, and all of a sudden it's. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and they're looking around the room as if to say, what the hell just flew through it, you know? Because <laughs> in stage two sleep, you can still hear the world. It fades in and out, but you can still hear the world around you. Stage two sleep is considered a transition period between falling asleep and the next stages of deep sleep, stages three and four. These two stages are usually blended together. As sleep advances progressively deeper, we become more difficult to arouse. People who wake during deep sleep often feel groggy and disoriented for several minutes. Stage three, four sleep is why we sleep. Uh, it's a biochemical stage. It's where a lot of repair is done. Uh, the cortex, the, um, that thin veneer that covers the brain, is shut down. Um, and there's a lot of biochemical work that's done there. So it's a really important stage of sleep. It takes us about 30 minutes from the time that we hit stage one sleep until we go into stage four. Sleep specialist Dr. John Reed from the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. It's that really deep, heavy sleep that you're hard to arouse and it's actually the stage of sleep when growth hormone is secreted so uh, children have a lot of this and it's actually when people grow. With most small kids you can pick them up and move them from the playroom to, to their bed without them waking up and that's because they're in this really deep stage of sleep. Uh, adults don't have as much of that so adults don't tend to sleep quite as, as deeply and as soundly but we all do have it and it's the recovery sleep so uh, if you have been working long hours or staying up late and then you have an opportunity to have a nice long sleep we'll often rebound into a lot of this stage three four sleep. There are four major events that happen in stage four sleep. First your body stabilizes potassium. Potassium is absolutely essential for brain neuron communication. It also regulates heart rate. Second, during stage four sleep, your body stabilizes sodium. Again, sodium is essential for the regulation of brain neuron communication. It also regulates body fluids. Third, during stage four sleep and only during stage four sleep, your body produces an esteterol steroid called hydroxycorticosteroid 17. It's the foundation of your immune system. Fourth, during stage four sleep and only during stage four sleep, you get the largest amount of production of human growth hormone. For a child, HGH is absolutely essential for growth and physical development. For adults, there are two theories. One says that HGH actually goes in and repairs cells. The other theory says it stops any further degradation of the cell itself. After you go in through stage four sleep, you go up into a stage of sleep called REM, and everybody knows about REM, rapid eye movement sleep. This is where you get these um, crazy, colorful, fast-moving dreams, that sometimes really sexy dreams. REM sleep is triggered by neural functions deep within the brain, which release one type of neurotransmitter to turn REM sleep on and another to turn it off. REM sleep is different from non-REM sleep, there is irregularity in blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, and body temperature, along with a state of semi-paralysis. As the night progresses, more time is spent in REM sleep. This phase is when the brain is actively sorting and storing information. For most people, the sleep cycle remains constant, providing adequate rejuvenation to function normally throughout the day. But what happens when the normal sleep pattern is disrupted? We fragment our sleep, either um, through diet or through stress, whatever. We fragment our sleep, which means that what we do is we break up the cyclicity of sleep. We break up the cycles. The higher the level of sleep fragmentation, the higher the level of waking fatigue. We do that in a lab. Put somebody who's really healthy, good sleeper, we put them into the lab and we fragment their sleep. I mean, we put noises in the room, we slam doors, we do all of these things to, not solely to wake them up, but to jar them out of one stage and put them up into another. In other words, fragment their sleep. The more we do that, the next day when we give them tasks to do, tasks they had no difficulty doing on a baseline day, suddenly they have difficulty doing it. Visual acuity drops off. They don't remember what they see auditory acuity drops off. They don't remember what they hear. Small and large motor acuity drops off. Little tasks that they do with, with their hands become more difficult when they don't have good quality sleep. 
Well, the quality of sleep affected my stress level. You need more than uh, three or four hours of sleep to really uh, be yourself and to function in uh, a proper way. So the days that you didn't get enough sleep, you just didn't have the patience for anything. Uh, you're, you have diminished mental capacity as well, so it, uh, it certainly does affect you a lot. When you get anxious and uh, you just get angry and frustrated um, and you have to really control yourself. You can't, you can't move too quickly, you can't force yourself to do things in a hurry. You just have to take it really, really steady because sleep deprivation, if you've never experienced it, is, is really um, asking for a lot of trouble from a safety issue. You, you'll do things that you never thought you'd do before, um, but that's because you just don't have enough sleep. Your body's not ready to work. We all have circadian rhythm, whether you look at a little fruit fly or whether we look at a human being, we do have a sleep-wake uh, cycle or rest-wake cycle. Circadian rhythm is an internal biological clock that regulates a variety of processes according to an approximate 24-hour period. Circadian rhythms are important in determining human sleep patterns. A circadian rhythm disorder can be caused by shift work, pregnancy, time zone changes, medications, and changes in routine. Whether it's working a day job and returning to the farm to do evening work, or working a job that has shift work involved and fitting the farm work in between, farmers are actually working a double shift, if not more. According to a Saskatchewan Government Commission study, a majority of shift workers express concerns about fatigue and drowsiness on the job. The report also stated that shift workers are more likely to experience a wide range of digestive problems and have higher than normal rates of heart disease. As with shift workers, off-farm workers may experience similar health problems and show symptoms such as daytime sleepiness, depression, digestive problems, and diminished alertness. The usual routine after we uh, finished our shift, midnight shift, about 90% of the guys would head over to our favorite restaurant and uh, have our fill of coffee and a big breakfast and then we would head home. Driving home after our big restaurant meal, your focus would tend to just narrow and narrow and narrow. And I remember not seeing a stoplight or a car really. It was just the, the lock on the trunk of the car and oh, it's getting close, okay, I better stop. And that was my focal point was that small already, you know. So I would guess I was probably about that far from being asleep at the wheel. I had a lot of, a lot of digestive problems when I worked shift work. I had uh, more headaches, I, I generally, my health was not as good. I got many more colds and flus. You just always have this aching behind your eyes. You just have this tired ache behind your eyes. When you get away from shift work, it just goes away. It's just gone. People who work shift, uh, shifts are, are quite frequently uh, sleep deprived for a variety of reasons. One of them is they're supposed to function when they're naturally sleepiest. And of course, they're supposed to sleep when everybody else is functioning around them. So there's a lot of environmental disruption to their sleep. Uh, we know that sleep during the day is not as good a quality sleep as it is at night. And the length of sleep is also less. Um, and depends on the cycle that they go through with, it, with their uh, uh, work schedule, it may be very disruptive to go from days to nights in a very repetitive short cycle. Um, so there really isn't an easy, easy um, uh, answer to that other than to say that we, we really are not designed to work nights and it should be as, as little as possible. When people are overtired, it is very common that their impulse control goes down and most people will realize that if they have worked night shift or been up all night, they can't stick with their diet the next day or all the bad habits come out, all the things that they were doing so well just fall apart. The decrease in acuity and cognitive function can be associated with lower productivity, a greater risk for post-night work accidents, more severe on-the-job injury and irritability leading to alienation from co-workers and marital breakdown. It does affect their relationships. Uh, they can become cranky with their spouse. There, there's de some depression. There's 
uh, certainly a lot of frustration. His lucky break was he went to the farm. <laughs> yeah, he jumped in my truck. Didn't so know he was didn't, out of there, you know. He didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I say he was lucky. You know, he didn't have to live with it so long. The kids did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you got too cranky, I'm out of here. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I got stuff to do at the farm, so yeah. see you later. <laughs> and that's how it was. Well, just to save a huge fight or whatever over something stupid or over <laughs> yeah. nothing, actually. You know, just because of the no sleep thing. Yeah. You know, I wasn't like, thinking not, straight. You know, and, yeah, 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 a lot and of times. I'll just get out of here and then she's got nobody to fight with. <laughs> I get home, everything will be cool. Having a poor night's sleep once in a while is one thing, but experiencing fatigue, sleepiness, headaches, poor concentration, and irritability on an ongoing basis are signs of serious sleep deprivation. Many who experience these symptoms turn to drugs to alleviate the problem. What's really interesting is that chronically bad sleep produces chronically bad sleep. I mean, once you start, it builds up. And the thing is that typically most of us don't intervene. We don't take the time to actually do something about it. We usually go to a physician, and a physician typically will drug it. There are multiple farmers coming in saying that it is uh, seeding time. I, I need some sleeping pills to uh, help me sleep at night because I just can't shut off when it's time to come in and I, I know I need to sleep at night so that I can be awake to run the tractor through the day. If you look at TV these days, you'll see any number of ads for um, medications that will get you to sleep. The problem is that these medications will get you to sleep. No question about that. But it doesn't stabilize your sleep. I mean, it just simply doesn't. It'll get you to sleep, but if you've, if you've got anxiety going on, you're still gonna show anxiety in your sleep. Sleeping pills help you sleep by depressing your nervous system. Instead of a restful sleep, this produces an exhausting sleep. Sleeping pills can also interfere with REM sleep, causing impaired concentration and memory. Likewise, over-the-counter drugs don't work well, and they may change your normal sleep patterns, leaving you tired the next day. If sleeping pills are not the answer, then what can we do? First of all, take a look at your bedroom. I mean, my bedroom is... Um, I use every trick in the book. I have a white noise generator in it. My bedroom is anywhere between three and five degrees cooler than the rest of the house. I change my sheets regularly. I have a pillow that has taken me years to find my perfect pillow. Change your pillow every six months. It's a breeding ground for critters. Why? You drool and then you breathe into it and you heat it up and the critters just love it. And then they shit and you inhale their feces. <laughs> I use nothing but 100% cotton sheets. I have uh, dust mite covers on both my pillow and my mattress. I make sure that there's no light coming in. In other words, my bedroom is in what's called stumble darkness. Now, my habit is I go to sleep to music. So my music shuts off at, after 60 minutes. Some people have the habit of going to sleep with the TV on, which is fine as long as you've got it on a timer. Because the variation in sound coming up, we all know that ads come on much louder than the regular program. So that's enough to jar you back up into another stage of sleep. So look at your bedroom as something that is going to help you through the next day. Check your bed out. I mean, your mattress should be the best piece of furniture in the house, period. The average mattress will accumulate 10 pounds of dead critters and their feces over a 10-year period. You weigh a mattress, boom, and then you put it with just one body. We're talking about one body. Over a 10-year period, the mattress will gain 10 pounds. One of the things that's most important to me is that I have a, a little device that fits on my bedside lamp. And what it does is seven and a half hours after I go to sleep, it turns the light up slowly. So I wake up into the light. 
but the general recommendation is to take the stimulation out of the bedroom. The stimulating activities really should be in the other areas of the house and the bedroom should be reserved mostly for sleep and the expectation should be that when the person turns the lights out and puts their head down that they're going to fall asleep in, in reasonably short order. Paying attention to nutrition and getting the proper exercise are other ways to combat insomnia. Experts recommend that alcohol and all forms of caffeine such as tea, coffee, cola and chocolate be avoided for a healthy sleep. Some people are very sensitive to caffeine to the point where one or two cups in even an early afternoon may affect the quality of sleep. Others are perhaps less sensitive. Uh, but caffeine is a, is a stimulant and it's, it's quite common in our society. Alcohol is used by many people as a relaxant in the evening. But when used as a sleeping aid, Research has shown that alcohol consumed within an hour of bedtime appears to disrupt the second half of the sleep period, causing fitful sleep and frequent awakening. We generally don't like people to eat heavy protein, heavy fatty meals right before sleep. Uh, they tend to be too full to sleep. It also, if the stomach is full and then people lie down, they're more likely to uh, experience gastroesophageal reflux, uh, which is uncomfortable and may awaken people from sleep. So generally we like people to eat, stick to a reasonably healthy diet and to eat several hours, at least eat their main evening meal several hours before sleep time. And obviously not to drink a lot of fluids immediately before bedtime so that they're not getting up to go to the bathroom. Suggested foods for the evening meal include legumes, whole grains, mushrooms, fruit, peanuts, fish or poultry. If a small snack is part of preparing for sleep, stay with high complex carbohydrates such as bread, bagels, and crackers. Also, lettuce has a reputation as an effective sleep remedy, but one of the oldest remedies for insomnia is warm milk with honey. The tryptophan in milk is converted to serotonin, promoting sleep. We're more overweight now than we were a few decades ago. And that, of course, impacts conditions such as uh, uh, sleep apnea and affects uh, the quality of sleep. We are a nation of overeaters and as a consequence have one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. What does weight have to do with sleep? Weight gain can trigger sleep disorders which will promote weight gain which can worsen the sleep disorder and a vicious cycle is started. If left untreated it can lead to heart attack, high blood pressure and stroke. So a proper diet is necessary. Coupled with proper diet is getting a reasonable amount of exercise. In general, exercise reduces stress, eases tension, increases oxygen flow, and creates a sense of well-being. In addition, exercise puts stress on the body, increasing the amount of time spent in deep sleep. The best exercises are those that work the big muscles in the legs. So jogging, swimming, riding a bicycle, jumping rope, dancing, using a treadmill, and walking are all good exercises to help with sleep. It's suggested that exercise should take place at least three hours prior to going to bed. Napping is one of the fine arts that we have lost in this culture. I'm one of these people that absolutely believes that one of the things you got to do when you work is to take a 20 minute nap halfway through your working period, whether it's a day work or night work. I mean, the research work is so clear on this. If you get into the habit of taking something as simple as a 20 minute nap, Productivity goes up, your attention goes up, fatigue drops down, you have more energy to do things. Originally when we start, I started working the 12 hour shift, they told us you can go for your break, but you cannot sleep. Like that was just a no, no. If you were caught sleeping, you were in trouble. If we're not alert with the long hours and take these breaks and have, have your uh, farm accidents, is the next scary part for me. It will happen. Because if we get run down, tired, s s stuff happens on the farm, it's not pleasant. So it's better to take the time and, and relax, take your break, and like, like from the workshop said, you, you want a half hour nap, you take it. I said if, to all the guys, you need to put your head down for 10 minutes or, or, or just for that little bit, so you get uh, refreshed and I said, you do that. Don't nod and nod all the way down the field and then hit the slough or, or whatever, you know. So uh, now we've got this 
We never knew about the 20-minute part before. And uh, sometimes they hide behind the bush and go a little longer, but, you know, whatever. But uh, I'd rather them take that time and get refreshed and then keep going. Because the causes of sleep deprivation are so vast, ranging from physical disabilities to lifestyle choices to emotional disorders, it may be hard to identify just what exactly is disrupting your sleep. If you are experiencing daytime sleepiness, headaches, irritation, difficulty concentrating, slow reactions, or emotional outbursts, visit your doctor. He may recommend you to a sleep clinic for further examination. Our center sees about 12 to 1300 patients per year with a variety of sleep disorders. In Saskatchewan, over 80 sleep disorders have been identified. Of these 80, the more common ones include insomnia, sleep apnea, restless leg disorder, and narcolepsy. Insomnia is the term used when falling and staying asleep is a problem. Insomnia may be incidental, lasting one or two evenings. It may be short-term, lasting up to two to three weeks, or it can be an ongoing chronic problem. Sleep apnea is a condition that causes people to have a prolonged pause in breathing or even a complete stoppage of breath during sleep. This can happen when the brain is not sending the signal to breathe to the muscles, or in some cases the airway collapses while sleeping. These prolonged pauses in breathing cause the oxygen level in the blood to drop. When the amount of oxygen reaching the brain decreases, the brain signals the body to wake up and take a breath, disrupting the sleep cycle. Restless leg syndrome is characterized by an irresistible urge to move the body to stop uncomfortable or odd sensations. Although it may affect the arms and torso, it's most common in the legs. The sensation is hard to describe, but it may feel like a tickle, a burning, or an itch. By moving the affected body part, temporary relief can be achieved. Narcolepsy is a neurological disorder affecting the part of the brain that regulates when to be asleep and when to be awake. Narcoleptics can fall asleep, sometimes without warning, during the day at inappropriate times, such as at work or school, and most experience fragmented nighttime sleep. Sleep conditions or sleep problems do not usually come on suddenly, particularly if we're talking about sleep apnea. It's not a condition that's not there one day and develops overnight. It's a condition that people are usually, have usually had for many years or maybe their entire life. So they may not have an appropriate baseline to, uh, to compare what a good quality sleep is. That may just be life as they know it. At the sleep clinic, technicians will likely perform a series of tests and ask you about your lifestyle as they attempt to pinpoint the cause of your sleep deprivation. Knowing what's preventing you from falling and staying asleep is essential to getting the right treatment. The commonest sleep disorder in society is insomnia, and that can be a difficult thing to treat, um, but certainly not impossible. The commonest reason for, for insomnia is, um, is what we call psychophysiologic insomnia, where external pressures such as stress, uh, for any reason have prevented people from sleeping well and it tends to have a bit of a vicious cycle as once the insomnia starts for any reason it can take a life of its own and then people develop a lot of negative associations with sleep fear or or really just bad negative attitudes about going to sleep because the expectation is that the sleep is going to be poor quality and frustrating and this can get worse and worse night after night uh, so that over the course of either months or years people just develop very bad associations with sleep and, and chronically poor sleep. Sleep apnea alone is, is as common or more common than diabetes. We estimate that obstructive sleep apnea alone affects about 35,000 people in Saskatchewan. Now the problem with apnea, apnea is where you literally stop breathing. The problem is every time you stop breathing, you literally fragment your sleep. So what happens, of course, is that the higher the level of sleep fragmentation, the higher the level of fatigue. We diagnose them by doing a sleep study, and we typically treat them with um, a machine called a CPAP machine, continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, and there are already about 10 to 11,000 of people in the province on, on this treatment, so it's not a rare disease. I have sleep apnea. The consequences 
of having sleep apnea are destructive. I mean, um, uh, your cognition is goes downhill because you can't think because you're too tired. Um, it's very hard to uh, have even temperament. Your stress will go up because you can't get rested. So you, you know, it's a, it's a vicious circle. What happens when you don't get quality sleep? You get a sense of alienation, nobody understands me. You become cynical, you have a short fuse, and you become incredibly resistant to change. I mean, those are the four characteristics that researchers from all around the world have found. Sleep deprivation puts us at higher risk for certain cancers, late onset diabetes, fertility problems, stroke, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, and the inability to absorb prescription medication. I think over the course of, of the last hundred years, people had forgotten about sleep and considered it to, considered to be an inconvenience, something that got in the way of getting work done. And in the last few years, we're starting to think not only is it important for your health, but it may, if you pay attention to having adequate sleep, you may improve the work that you do because you'd be like, more likely to be efficient, function well, and make less mistakes. When it comes to concentration and focus, getting adequate sleep is essential, whether it's an agricultural operation, on a construction site, playing sports or driving. Getting adequate sleep can be the difference between success and failure, or even life and death. The Sleepless in Saskatchewan workshops were created to highlight the importance of sleep in our lives. The Sleepless in Saskatchewan workshops, the, the first thing is it's an evening of entertainment or a day of entertainment. You always felt guilty, you know, you thought you went to bed at 11, you should be up at 7, that's 8 hours of sleep, but 8 hours isn't uh, mm -hmm. the rule, you know, and I think that's what I learned from John Shear. Working more hours in a day maybe isn't the most efficient way to do things, and sometimes you just have to shut her down. To be safe you have to be alert, and to be alert you have to be rested. Sleep affects us all and we all have questions or know of someone that struggles with sleep or feeling tired during the day and um, when that content is partnered with a workshop that is known to be entertaining and humorous, um, the uptake has been excellent. When I think of uh, Sleepless in Saskatchewan and I think of where society is going, uh, sleep is going to be a long-term issue with people. For the farm stress line, it means that it gives us something, uh, information and resources that we can apply to the uh, issues that callers uh, call us about when they're addressing issues around sleep and issues around stress. If, if people do not step back and just take it slower, improve this up, farm accidents will happen. And they're happening right now. You know, and if we can save someone's leg, someone's arm, someone's life, that's what I'm looking for. But your family is one of the most important variables. I mean, if you live with people that love you and care for you and really treat you with respect, treat you honestly, I mean, it can't help but improve the quality of your life and by that improve the quality of your sleep. That's it. Right on time. Thank you.